will address the issues and explore viable and sustainable means to plan the care. Once again, I welcome all of you to this brainstorming session and I hope you will see a ray of light through this dark pandemic, uncertain pandemic. Thank you. Over to Dr. Shivoptas. Thank you, sir, for your speech. Now, I would like to request Dr. Subhash Barman Sal, Principal of Walpara College, to deliver an inaugural speech for this national webinar. Over to Dr. Barman Sal, sir. Uh, good morning to all participants, esteemed resource persons, Dr. Bordhuya, Dr. Sokroborty, President of Governing Body, Dr. Binay Kumar Nath, H.O.D. Uh, Podip Sutia, my esteemed colleague from the Department of Geology, esteemed participants, warm welcome. So uh, you all know that uh, the whole world is witnessing an unprecedented situation due to COVID-19. Uh, a situation has arisen for which nobody was ready. Even all college universities, we were also not ready. So since December and in the rest part of the world and here since uh, the last half of March, from 22nd March, we are witnessing a uh, lockdown and closure of uh, institutions. And almost all sectors, education, health, economy, almost all sectors have been very badly affected by this pandemic. And this is a historic moment. We mankind witness a uh, uh, onslaught, whether we are ready, whether we can face it or not, or whether how much we are prepared that has been, our resilience has been tested now. Anyway, uh, this uh, COVID-19 situation, it uh, transformed the whole uh, pedagogy, whole whole learning, teaching learning process. And uh, we, are, we, all, we are also, as a college, we are also preparing for uh, transforming our uh, learning, uh, teaching learning process to online and uh, digital mode. Uh, uh, in, in our majors and in other subjects, we have been continuing within limitations online classes. But uh, this is a very different sort of time. Um, the, our, our governments, our economy, our uh, education, everything has been devastated. But uh, in this historic moment, there are some opportunities are also coming up. Uh, one opportunity is today we are coming together and to grad scholar, Dr. Mostafa A. Borbuya and Dr. Tabajit Chakraborty, who have been living in different parts of the world. Dr. Borbuya is from Stats, and Tabajit uh, Chakraborty is from um, Austria, from Vienna, Austria's capital, Vienna. So these two scholars, they have come together to address certain issues that, that is uh, issues of concern for all of us. Uh, uh, we have seen that this, uh, particularly government of India and uh, University Grants Commission, everyone wants that college universities would do something which is relevant to our society, which is relevant to our uh, people who are living around us. So in this uh, critical juncture, in this COVID-19 situation, uh, these two, two, two scientists, one who is a pathologist, Dr. Mustafa Ahmed Borbuya. Uh, Dr. Borbuya has been working, uh, has been very delicately working for a long time. And uh, today we have understand that in, we have, uh, Dr. Borbuya is supposed to present his uh, topic on COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on human and environment. The history is Dr. Borbuya, he is working on uh, biochemistry as, as biochemist and 
as pathologist and presently he is working on the most critical issue of the virus is the nature of the virus how people will try to uh, manage the virus so uh, and the other part is uh, how the rest part of the world particularly steps is working and uh, how scientists have been uh, the world view of scientists towards this virus that have, that has been that will be deal by dr borbuya so Borbe, regarding borbuya his introduction will be there so i won't uh, repeat anything the thing is uh, both dr borbuya and devojoti chakraborty to great son of this country who have been in other parts of the world one is in united states of america another is in austria so these two uh, great son these two great scientists they have been enormously contributing towards understanding the issues of um, the, the issues of uh, impact on human this covid 19 and uh, another scientist that was the he is working on the forest issues so uh, uh, so far my knowledge goes uh, dr borbuya will discuss on the issue of uh, the, the virus and its impact on human and Devojuti Chakraborty, he is also a renowned scientist and who is working on issues of forest, how decline of forest has a very serious uh, correlation impact on our environment and uh, also with pandemics. So we have seen recently even, uh, this is an ongoing process, this has been, uh, which should not be, this is a man in this devastation. We have seen uh, in, in Amazon, Forest, uh, large and uh, which is known as uh, lung of the world that has been devastated. Then here in uh, here in Assam also we have seen Barzan issues. Then uh, so those how forest is uh, highly relevant to our environment and our civilization and our civilization that has been and that will be dealt by uh, Dr. Devojuti Sakraborty. So, uh, and, and I think Dr. Sokoboti will talk on how COVID-19, uh, it's, it's uh, how, how herbal medicines then uh, flora, fauna can be used for addressing uh, our people's concern. So, both these uh, scientists, we welcome Dr. Debozoti Sokoboti, Dr. Mustafa Eborbuya, this two great son of Assam. They are very patriotic person, though they are extremely busy, but, uh, uh, they have given time. Uh, I, I would like to uh, share my idea, but I, I'd like to uh, point out that uh, Dr. Borbia and Dr. Sokroborty, your effort, your uh, your your uh, this uh, your your giving time to us, it will be a meaningful endeavor because hundreds of participants, teachers, professors. Uh, both from, from, from geology, from other subjects, from social science and interested, concerned people are watching you. So your, your presentation will be a very meaningful thing, whatever you are doing in that parts of the world uh, that, that will, you will share and I'm sure we shall be benefited. And we sincerely look forward to work with you, both uh, Dr. Mustafa Borbuya and Dabozuri Sokroboti. So with these few words, uh, in this critical juncture, in this critical hist historical moment, this historic moment, because we are facing a very, very serious uh, situation on slot. So uh, at this uh, critical juncture, I am sure that this webinar will be a meaningful endeavor. So with these few words, I inaugurate this webinar. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, sir, for your nice and speech. So, as part of schedule, Hello. as part of schedule, we have two plenary sessions. Each session will be followed by discussion as well as question and answer session. Therefore, all the participants are requested to post their questions to the chat box. After the end of each session, I will forward the questions to the respective session. Now, it's time to start the first plenary session of this webinar. And for this, I'd like to request Dr. Amitra Hussain Barbia, sir, 
to introduce uh, the first speaker, Dr. Mustafa Borghia sir, uh, and also to start the program. Over to Dr. Borghia sir. Thank you, Dr. Jugarbot. So, yeah, I'm really very much happy to uh, see you all in this single platform in the critical situation. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Mustafa Ahmed uh, uh, I'm very much happy to introduce him. Although he is a son of Assam, he's working in the other part of the country and still giving some time for us in that uh, critical situation and uh, this one. So Dr. Mustafa uh, was uh, completed his graduation from Assam University Siljar. So Assam University Siljar, then he moved to the world, moved to Gwalior, Jivaji University Gwalior. From there he finished his master's and a doctoral degree from the same university. Uh, he completed his PhD in 2013. And then he moved to USA. There he joined John Hopkins University, Baltimore. And from there he uh, did two consecutive postdoctoral research, two terms, uh, one in 2015 and then in 2018. So his research was on bi uh, cancer biomarker and molecular oncology. And then he moved to uh, his present situation, present place, that is uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, he has a lots of publication and all. He has uh, around 30 research papers in his credit, including uh, international and international level and having high impact factor. So he is, a, uh, as, I, as our PC was said, he is son of the soil. Uh, although he is in, staying in USA, he's still working for India. You know, you know uh, he is the founder, he is the founder, president, uh, director, and chief scientific advisor of a, an organization, I think, it's FAAT, Foundation for Advancement of Essential uh, Diagnostics, which is situated in Guwahati, Biotechnology Park near IIT, Guwahati. So there we have, I can see some uh, uh, young scholars in our uh, seminar. So it is an encouragement and proud movement for us to share with you uh, that uh, he's serving even staying there in the outside. He's, he has uh, uh, the opened this organization and if you are interested, you can log in his website and you can see the details of Foundation for Advancement of Essential Diagnostics. Then, uh, his CV is very long. It's 14 pages. So it's, uh, as the time is stringent and uh, it's uh, not possible to share with you all. So I like to, uh, conclude here and today Dr. Mustafa will enlighten us about the various aspects of COVID-19 as our visual sir said and he is working with this so hope we will uh, get and we will enjoy get a good lesson and, and enjoy from him so with this few words uh, I like to conclude and I requested I like to request Dr. Mustafa Borboya to continue his uh, lecture thank you yeah, so thank you and good morning everybody in India. So uh, my time is midnight here. I'm sharing my screen with you all now. Can you see my screen? Yeah. And yes. it is, yes. It, yeah, and it is in slideshow. Okay, and uh, I am, uh, am I audible too? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you Anjam for your kind introduction. I am, I'm really uh, happy to be with all of you and uh, share uh, some of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 related pandemic and uh, 
uh, as Anjam mentioned, uh, I am a clinical biochemist. I work in clinical laboratory. Uh, we are really, really involved in COVID-19 testing here. Our laboratory does around 10 to 15,000 tests a day. And uh, I do have some research wing as well uh, related to SARS-CoV-2. And uh, uh, I have kept this webinar very simple and uh, just introductory. And I will not go to <laughs> of the technicalities of the SARS-CoV-2, but I will go over how it is impacting us. And it will be really, really interesting to listen about the ecology part, environment part as well, because uh, SARS-CoV-2 is actually a man-environment interaction type disease. And it is really impo important. And you, you have done a lot, lot of good work and thought I, I like this idea because how viruses are coming from the you know wild to human it's it's a logical issue as well so uh, the title of my uh, presentation i kept it this way the sars cov 2 global pandemic preparedness are the low and middle income countries ready so that that is one concern because we are seeing how developed world is crawling with the situation and we are crawling here and just two days back, uh, uh, Dr. Tim Amokele of Johns Hopkins and I wrote an op-ed in The Conversations Africa edition. Uh, that article is up. I'm really happy to share with you that uh, WHO model actually took the note of our article and has uh, done some course corrections. So if you can Google that and read about that as well. And it is just kind of standard. Uh, we work in a clinical laboratory setup. We uh, disclose any conflict of interest. I do not have any financial uh, conflict of interest uh, from this uh, presentation to disclose, but I do have a non-financial conflict. Like I am a founder director of Foundation for Advancement of Essential Diagnostics and honorary director of any group and business in India. So. The opinions and comments made in this presentation are my personal views, and it is not related uh, or to my institution or endorsed by my institution. Uh, before we start about, uh, you know, the, going to the nitty gitties, a few terms we should know. And as this audience is a wide uh, range of students, uh, uh, professors, lecturers, scholars, and many people around. So how we, we look at this kind of disease, and these are terminologies we should know, and we are reading newspaper and getting panicked and so on, but we should uh, know the real terms. And what is a disease outbreak? When we call it disease outbreak, it refers to the number of cases that exceeds what would be expected, right? For example, uh, what is expected? During rainy season, we get malaria in our countries, right? And during, uh, during like uh, winter season in America, we get flu. So it is expected that a flu is there, and it is expected during monsoon, we will get dengue and malaria, a little bit of that. However, if that exceeds what would be expected, that is an outbreak. And this is the case for the COVID-19 as well. And then people talk about endemic. What is an endemic? An infection within a geographic location that is existing perpetually. For example, I talked about malaria, right? So the malaria is endemic. Uh, it, it is just there. Dengue fever is already endemic in India. It is there. So uh, these are not really kind of spreading all over the masses at a time, etc. So that is kind of an endemic situation. What is an epidemic? When we say epidemic, what do we mean? A disease that affects a large number of people within a community, population, or region. Now, an epidemic can be, like for example, an endemic may become epidemic. For example, if during a monsoon season, Delhi is getting high number of dengue fever. Gohadi is getting high number of uh, dengue fever. That is regional within a city. That 
could be termed as epidemic. Now, it, an epidemic can be country-wise, it can be state-wise, etc. It can be located in Asia. It has not crossed the Asian boundary to America or Africa, or it could be located to Africa only or America only. That is epidemic. Now, what is a pandemic? It is a global thing. This is what is we are, what we are seeing in case of COVID-19. One of the fastest growing pandemic human society has seen since 1918. It has been 100 years. Human civilization has not seen such a great scale of pandemic so fast. And that pandemic in 1918 was called the Spanish flu. And this pandemic has taken the shape of 100 years back Spanish flu. And uh, by introducing these terminologies with all of you, uh, I just wanted to share with you that how many different types of viruses and uh, are there that can actually cause this kind of influenza and flu-like symptoms in human beings and their transmission. And it is kind of like all over the places. And as it is mentioned that man and environment interaction is very, very important. I really appreciate it. And we are in Assam. I am from Assam. We should preserve our ecology. We should preserve our uh, natural environment. We should not destroy them. I feel really, I, I do feel about those aspects as well. So many, many of these viruses actually has long history of association with human beings. Uh, if I just can zoom a little bit here, uh, look at that. So this is an HPV, this uh, hepatoviral family uh, that also come from bats in the past, then papillomaviridae and uh, some others. The avian influenza also came, uh, you know, 2000, uh, in 2000, 2002, 13, then there are swine flus coming from pigs and then other chimpanzees and gorillas and so on. What happens, uh, and of course, Dr. Chakravarti will highlight about it, that how we are responsible actually or causing the destruction of animals habitat and inviting those uh, to us. So these are kind of interesting things to look at. And then how it comes to human being. There are two different mechanisms uh, that uh, could happen in a wild uh, virus uh, that uh, and a wild virus uh, could have antigenic shift and antigenic drift in them. Antigenic drift actually does not cause the real problems. Uh, there are always small mutations are going on here and there. And uh, many, many people question that, oh, SARS-CoV-2 is now here in human. Many strains are getting all over the places and mutations happening. No. These are small mutations that happen, but as long as it is there and its viral properties are not changing, it's not going to harm us much. However, an antigenic shift happens. That is where the new subtype comes. For example, these uh, new SARS-CoV-2 came from, you know, the animals, bats, etc., and they took this uh, this shift and adopted human. And we do not know really how it happened, the transmission and uh, morts. It's really a matter of investigation. And of course, ecological questions also needs to be asked. And uh, th those are the kind of things. However, one thing is, uh, I mean, very clear. For now, whatever scientists know, Many, many sequences of the SARS-CoV-2 has been done all over the world, and there, these are there in the databases. Our institution also does some of those strain sequencing. However, but it is seen that over the last six months, so far, 
this virus has not mutated that much that it will cause you know new kind of property virulence etc it, it, it's still a good thing it's a good thing uh, i'm trying to uh, tell you a good uh, message that it's a good thing it's not these small mutations changes here and there it's not causing uh, a lot of uh, change in virulence property of the virus and uh, epidemiological comparison you know so this virus is there in the uh, world and what what are the difference of this virus with uh, the other viruses like for example if you look at this flu virus and one thing one thing here from this slide i would like you to share and emphasize on is this r0 you can see that r0 number that is called the basic reproductive number that how many person one person can infect how many other person for example an influenza virus it can if i am infected i can probably infect one more person infectivity the reproductive number and in case of covid 19 it is two to three if i am in kept the transmission is so fast for example other sars virus also has that this is not the pathogen yet the mars virus was also an epidemic earlier uh, kind of but it got receded and that was also not that infective in terms of uh, r0 number reproductive number Th this that is why this uh, covid 19 virus has took over all over the places so that it infects uh, so much I mean, one month later, it can be Brazil or it could be uh, America or India, who knows? So this case fatality will be evolving over the next four or five months because every country has 10, 10 lakh people infected and the fatality rate will show up in probably a month later or two months later. Now, coming to this, that this is very very important i work in the diagnostic area of the medicine and diagnosis how do we diagnose uh, this virus so this is an rna virus uh, those who are students listening to me uh, from gualpara college department of zoology i want to tell you i am also a bsc zoology honor student okay so you should know this that this is a uh, RNA virus and majority of the molecular test, the PCR, polymerase chain reaction test, uh, that detects this viral RNA and it, it amplifies and gives uh, signals. It is very sensitive. It needs an instrument to perform, and many of you probably know about it, and uh, uh, or you will be knowing in future. The other is like antigen test the antigen test means this you can detect the spike proteins however this is not very sensitive why it is not sensitive the reason is we do not have a mechanism that we can amplify the proteins in vitro however the polymerase chain reaction can amplify one number one copy of the uh, rna or dna and uh, amplify it to hundreds of copies and give a signal that is the technological difference however although it is less, less sensitive antigen based tests are very low cost it could be adopted and uh, i have been on the front line writing to the government of india writing to indian council of uh, medical research and uh, a month back to uh, probably 45 days back i did a webinar with 
uh, ex-director general of Indian Council of Medical Research, and I pushed for antigen-based tests uh, in India. And on June 26, just it took care time, but India has now adopted the antigen-based tests as well. It is a very good thing. And uh, as I mentioned that we have written this along with Professor Tima Mukala to World Health Organization. And it is just three days back, it is published in Africa. They are now adopting the antigen test modalities. So uh, the, the, the way it is, is like, we need something. Something is better than nothing, right? There should be something. Yeah, so we want to do PCR and we want to do machine and all these kind of things, but we don't have electricity in our rural hospitals. How do we deal with those situations? So we need our own uh, methods and our own ways, not always like how United States is doing or UK is doing and so on. So these are the kind of things that are going on in fight against this global pandemic. Another important, other kinds of tests, this is also educational. Uh, the students especially should know there are antibody tests for SARS-CoV-2. As I mentioned, that for diagnostic purposes, what we use is protein or RNA of viral origin. We should detect it. It, is, it will detect in zero to five days within one week. Then in the blood, and then these should be collected. These, should be collected from the nasopharynx uh, and the swab. Uh, and other things like blood tests, if your blood serum has developed an antibody like IgM or IgG against that virus, that could be detected. But these antibody tests are not useful for diagnosis because this is an immune response thing. It could be useful for later purposes that whether a person is immune to this virus or not, and uh, th those are other things to consider. Now, why testing is so important? People are saying that uh, testing is very, very important. First thing we should remember is as I mentioned, the reproduct uh, reproducibility rate of this virus, if I am infected by this COVID-19, potentially I could infect three other person. Now, I am a young person relatively still. Now, now I may remain asymptomatic. I may not know that I have the virus, but I can be until and unless I am tested, just I have like flu and I have some or the sign of fever, small fevers and all these kind of things. I'm not getting tested, but I'm going to my workplace and infecting a 60 years old person who has cardiovascular disease or diabetic and so on, then I am, this is a problem, right? So that is why testing is so important. Even though somebody has small symptoms, like uh, fever and cough and colds and uh, so on. But if that person is suspected of COVID-19, he or she should be tested so that his own family members can be protected from this. And that's how we, we can uh, break the chain. And second uh, layer of problem is that there is no antiviral therapies yet available, very effective. However, doctors manage this virus case by case. Uh, the so latest is dexamethasone, uh, that is just in June 25, NIH has provided guidelines for use of dexamethasone who, who, where oxygen is not needed. Otherwise, fine, there is no breathing problem, those patients can be done, uh, can, can be dealt with dexamethasone. So the issue is that that isolation, contact tracing and breaking the chain, all these kind of things. And as I mentioned that around 25 to 35% of the people who are asymptomatic, they're just okay. Uh, and uh, they have not tested, but they have uh, spread the disease. So this is what is happening. And that is why the testing is important. So the, this is again, like for the educational purposes, this is the how molecular tests 
a nucleic acid detection works. So you obtain the swab specimen from the nasopharynx, you extract RNA from the specimen, and then you do reverse transcriptase PCR reaction, RT reaction to convert it to DNA and then amplify by PCR uh, using the SARS-CoV-2 specific primers. And then you get the signals in terms of amplification plots and detect that. So uh, this is a complex process. Uh, instrument prices is five to 10 lakhs, 15 lakhs. One instrument cost is that high. And uh, this is one of the limitation of this cost. And second thing is the contamination issue. The false positivity may be due to the contamination of the RNA template that is in the laboratory, no precautions and so on. And uh, a lot of the other issues are also there that it takes two to five hours depending on methods, strain manpower to perform and the quality assurance of the tax, scalability. We cannot scale up this in the, in the low and middle income countries is another problem. And uh, uh, the, there are point of care tax uh, available uh, for those essays as well. Uh, what does that point of care test mean? Uh, so these point of care tests are employed uh, outside a laboratory facility. Like you can take those uh, tests uh, to the field and can do that. And uh, as, uh, as it was mentioned earlier too, I do have plans for Assam as I set up that foundation. I was just, as I mentioned, I mean, I, I was about to come in March and uh, August uh, to set some of those things, but pandemic is, no, not allowing. And I set that up in 2018 uh, to work on those issues because I, I felt that it is it was necessary for our states and our places. And then one and a half years later, pandemic came in and, uh, and we are still unprepared. So there are examples of point of care testing like glucometers for measuring blood, uh, blood sugar, handheld chemistry analyzers for measuring hemoglobin, troponin, cardiac enzymes, blood gases, all this. And one best example is like many of you may be familiar with home pregnancy test, the HCG test. So those are uh, the real example of point of care test like this. Even those in the zoology and chemistry, you use pH strip, right? So this, whenever a student use a pH strip, uh, they should imagine that pH strip is a point of care device. Look at that. We do have uh, those kind of things and point of care testing could be done. And antigen-based testing is based on the lateral flow chemistry of these uh, uh, pH strips. So uh, think about it, uh, how you could develop such a uh, method in this uh, crisis situation. Uh, are point of care molecular tests available? Uh, the nucleic acid based? Yes, these are available. However, these are very, very costly uh, for nucleic acid type. As I mentioned that there are around uh, 10 different methods available that could be taken to the field. And if you have electricity, you can just use that machine. You don't need manual preparation of nucleic acid, etc. However, these are very costly methods. And I do envision, I do envision that I will bring some of those technologies to Gohari. And my goal is not Gohari at all. My goal is to reach out to the rural Assam, <coughs> rural hospitals in Assam and bring those available in coming years. We are preparing and I hope we will beat this pandemic as well. So these are a few examples. And I just picked up as a pictorial diagram to show you that these are robust machines that has been developed by different in vitro diagnostic companies. You can take them to literally field and test them. For example, uh, in uh, Gualpara, a rural village, there is a rural health center. They do not have all this facility for an extraction and all these kind of things. Uh, if they have, for example, a small of these kind of instruments uh, that can really do this and 
it's easy to train manpower in this uh, area uh, in these instruments as well because these are not complex current state of testing around the world so let us just go around the world again uh, you see i mean it's just a scale it's an old scale but nothing has changed over a month for example in the united states the testing rate is about uh, 10% uk 10% russia 10% some places in europe are even 15% uh, but what about Africa and other Asian countries? India is now reaching towards 1% testing rate, 1% of the population. But in African countries, they are still behind. It is less than 1%. So there is a huge gap in this pandemic fight against the pandemic. So we need to really ramp up those low cost tests for those low and middle income countries. And uh, as things are progressing moving forward in that direction why this testing disparity uh, i mean why it is happening because testing molecular uh, molecular tests are very complex these are costly uh, uh, 10000 to 30000 us dollars that is 10 15 lakhs of indian rupees per instrument and these cannot be scaled up uh, this is a very, very genuine concern, low-income countries, uh, you see. So the 20 countries around the world has less than 10,000 of per capita GDP. How they will buy or purchase an instrument that costs 10,000 US dollar. So there is a lot of disparity in these aspects as well. So as global community, we need to uh, learn about how uh, we can share resources amongst those areas. So this is just a per capita GDP from a uh, picture from International Monetary Fund that I just mentioned that how it is. Antigen tests, I talked about the antigen test that it is quick, cheap and scalable. These things are catching up. We just wrote in India, June 26 onwards, antigen tests are approved by ICMR, and these are getting scaled up. Quality remains an issue, but something is better than nothing in the domain. So, and quality eventually will improve when there will be five, 10 different companies making it. One company will try to compete with the other company to make the antigen detection kit better. So, and this is a challenge again. I mean, I, I really, if there is Gohadi folks, I, I encourage IIT Gohadi folks to look at this. These are, IIT Gohadi has all the resources to develop antigen lateral flow chromatography antigen test. All they need to do is they clone this S protein and the spike protein and develop the chromatographic methods to detect those. So those avenues should be open you know, from our institutions as well. And this is how the technology works, the lateral flow immunoassays. It is uh, as, I mean, the simplest term is pH strip. Those students who are biological science background, everybody has used a pH strip in their life. They know how the pH strip works. And that is how a lateral flow chromatography also works. Uh, so I, I will, I will, I have talked a lot of these and I already mentioned that our institutions are capable of doing this. I will move to how it spreads person to person, know how about the spread, be careful that you choose around six feet distance, maintain the uh, six feet distance. This is very, very important. And don't allow your respiratory drop, droplet to get out, always, uh, wash your hands, hand wash, and uh, you know, whatever you are touching, etc. Soap and water is absolutely fine and really good. Use soap and water more often. Don't use all these hand sanitizers. The best way is soap and water, etc. Avoid close contact. Even inside your home, if you are feeling not okay, maintain six feet distance. And outside your home also please maintain six feet distance this is very very important six feet distance 
cover your mouth and nose with cloth face cover when around others. Please do not waste surgical masks that are meant for doctors because supplies are very, very scarce. You can prepare your own mask, you know? So this is how you can prepare your own mask. You can just, you know, we have gamochas, you know, Assam has gamochas, Assam has no problem. Use your own gamocha, you know? So, and that's how you protect yourself. And uh, th this is cultural, right? We use a gamocha, so that, that works. So, and watch for symptoms. If you have fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, headache, sore throat, congestion, runny nose, nausea, or vomiting, diarrhea, continuous, all this kind of thing, watch for your symptoms and take precautions. Stay home, take care of yourself, and stay in touch with your doctor if your symptoms are getting worse. 80 to 90 percent of the cases, if you are not having any comorbidity, you will be fine. Even the virus catches you. But be careful. Don't spread it if you have cough and colds, etc. Separate yourself from other people. Monitor, continue to monitor your symptoms. If you have shortness of breath and continuous pains, and if you are unable to breathe, please go to see doctors. This is when you need to go to the doctors. And the treatments, there are a lot of things coming up, uh, going on as viral diseases are actually very difficult to treat. Antiviral medications are on and on. Uh, so WHO has ramped up the vaccine development. So there are many people ask about vaccines, etc. But vaccines i don't i mean it is my personal perception a lot of these things are coming out of phase one trial phase two trial it will take six months to one year at least for coming up and uh, uh, this is my foundation and i actually from indian side in january uh, january third week i have translated all the covid 19 materials in english hindi assamese bengali boro and manipuri I mean, uh, my foundation was the first, first foundation to provide all the materials in internet uh, in all this translated version. These are all available and you can click those, uh, print it, use it. Uh, and I, I provided uh, to, you know, emailed all this to agencies, government agencies, uh, the health ministry in Assam as well, those Assamese, Bengali, Borough, Monipuri translations. So, uh, use those resources, visit WHO pages, and uh, take care of yourself. And at the end, you know, the life is beautiful. And is, if there are questions, um, so how are the questions handled? So are we allowed to ask right now, or is there there will be a different? session for it i don't know yeah yeah it's uh, uh thank you thank you dr Mustafa, for your valuable informative and thought-provoking lecture and there are lots of questions and those questions will be handled by our co-operative chapter jagobod das i request dr jagobod das to sort there are lots of questions so i request dr jagobod das to sort a uh, few questions as time is very less uh, we have to start with the next session so I request Dr. Jagobad Das. Are you here? Dr. Jagobad? Can you listen to me? Dr. Jagobad? Jagobad? Thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, uh, repeat your question to two, three questions. The main yes. questions. Okay. And those Thank other you. questions, we can communicate with uh, the resource person and he can answer afterwards also through mail or etc. Over to the uh, Thank you, Mr. Anjan Mishin Bolivia, sir, as well as Dr. Mustafa, sir, for his uh, valuable and very informative uh, speech in the presentation. Now it's time for question and session. And uh, the chat box is with numbers of questions to the speaker, but keeping the time limit in mind, I am uh, taking important questions. The first question uh, by Vishwajit Paul, 
can the virulence of the virus be changed by mutation as it being as uh, an asexual organism what are the challenges in the in this regard okay so yeah yeah i i have mentioned this in the in the presentation as well bishwajit and i can read those question in the chat box as well if i am allowed i can just go over and answer the question is it okay yes sir okay i will be quick so bishwajit uh, can the virulence of the virus uh, be changed by mutation as it is in okay so uh, we i talked about it virus can be mutated and uh, many many virus for example in our body we mutate every day not every mutation is bad or pathogenic so so far we know this virus has mutated when it came to human beings however there has not been clinically relevant virulence property change in the mutation and <coughs> technology diagnosis of coronavirus which strains are now threat for us please note that sars cov2 has only one strain so far there are research papers publications lot of things going on that are research research and clinically relevant viral property is different so so far we are diagnosing only one virus even it in austria america germany there are some mutations here and there it doesn't matter it has not changed its viral property and it is good thing for us right it is good we should be appreciative of it how do we get tested if we have asymptomatic coronavirus so asymptomatic coronavirus can be tested by calling your medical doctor going to a place whatever modus operandi in place uh, in assam probably mostly the designated uh, viral research uh, viral diagnostic research laboratories bdrls are in place in medical colleges and some are now going to be extended to civil hospitals these are at fours you should contact there uh, so if a vaccine will develop then it will vaccine will be fruitful for further since viruses can mutate paramita chakravarti so viruses and can mutate yes however through the understanding of our knowledge we have gone so far that we can sequence the human uh, human genome viral genome is small so for example flu vaccines all over the world is developed every year and we know how the virus mutates and how the virus be behaves so even if the virus mutates a little bit here and there human knowledge has become so powerful then we can deal with that it will not be that problematic until and unless it is getting shifted and getting a new subtype so then only it will be problematic and fortunately till now when it came from animal to human this virus has not done anything of that sort yet this is a good thing and i hope it, it does not okay so what different types of tests so antigen antibody tests antigen i will just skip that and shubham shailesh arpana dash is it airborne or not there is a lot of traction going on on that we still need evidence for whether it is airborne or not so far cdc who guidelines says it is not airborne and such viruses are not generally airborne however there are some conflicting uh, things coming up but it it is not substantiated by lot of evidence how is antigen based test better than rt pcr and also how do they overcome the problem of false positive shubham shailesh very good question antigen test tests are not better than rt pcr no it is not i am not saying that also how do they overcome a problem of false positive so these are there i mean uh, so we do lot of tests you should uh, go to my article uh, how african countries uh, get cheap and uh, cheap tests for covid 19 and how to get them we have argued with the director of clinical laboratories of johns hopkins bayview medicine that how clinical laboratory tests cannot be cheap accurate and clinically reliable simultaneously three thing if it is highly accurate it is high cost and it is highly uh, equipment centric and all these kind of things 
but it may not be useful for a large population. So you need to ma maintain a balance and those balance has to be maintained by specialists. That is why uh, the physicians, pathologists come into force. And that is where the problem of uh, false positivity will be overcome by the specialist intervention and their clinical judgment. So I think, yeah, so any other questions? Is the virus supposed to be mutant one? I talked a lot about that. Accessibility of the society, World Health Organization in the last, sale, uh, last slide I have shared that uh, there is an ACT forum of WHO for making the virus uh, vaccine available. Vitamin C, beneficial, all this. Stay healthy, stay safe. Uh, uh, right, right. All right, I think I covered a lot of it. And if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to email me. Yep, I don't want to take much of next speaker's time. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Dr. Mustafa Borghia sir. And I think the participants uh, have got their answer. And now it's time to move to the second presentation. And uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Devajiti Chakraborty from uh, Austrian Research Center for Forest, Vienna. And uh, for this, I would like to request Dr. Virash Kumar Bora sir to introduce Dr. Chakraborty sir and also to start the program. Over to Dr. Bora sir. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jugobrod. A good morning and a very warm welcome to everybody once again. I, on behalf of the Department of Zoology, take the privilege to introduce our next eminent speaker this morning, uh, my good friend, Dr. Devozuti Sokraborty. Uh, he is the double MSc, the first MSc he did from the Forest Research Institute, Dehradun. And the second MSc he did from the University of Freiburg, Germany. And he did his PhD from the University of Life Science, Vienna, Austria. Uh, he did his postdoc from the University of British Columbia, Canada, and Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, which is in Zurich, Switzerland. Hello, am I audible? Yes. 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 Okay. okay. Lastly, okay. fine. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, presently, he is a senior scientist in the Austrian Research Center for Forestry and Climate Change in Vienna. He has many achievements to his credit, but looking at the time constraints, I will read out a few. Dr. Chakraborty is a visiting professor at the University of Life Science Vienna that is in Austria. He is also a visiting professor at the University of British Columbia, Canada. His research focuses on climate change modeling and adapting forests to the climate change. He has a good number of research papers published in various journals of national and international repute, having high impact factor. He also has a few research scholars pursuing PhD under his supervision. Uh, with these few words of introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Debojuti Chakraborty to take over and give his presentation. His talk today will focus on how the degradation of forest and biodiversity is related to human pandemic. So Dr. Chakraborty, if you can please take over, Thank you, Deiraj, and thank you for organizing such a wonderful uh, webinar, which is very topical, very relevant for this time. And I, when Deiraj actually approached me, I was quite, uh, I was in two mind because I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, but nevertheless, 
uh, I was told that uh, Mr. Mustafa will be talking and he is uh, a specialist in this field. So it is quite a good choice that he invited him and uh, we, I, I could also uh, like learn a lot of things that I always wanted to ask and like never knew what, what to do. And like, I have actually also quite a number of questions, but maybe we can talk uh, bilaterally later on and not eat upon the time uh, of this wonderful platform. Yeah. So uh, I would just start sharing my screen and let's see if it works. Can you see it in uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, that being said, uh, I will not talk about the the genetics part, the molecular biologic, the clinical part of the problem of the COVID-19. Uh, let's call uh, it not only COVID-related. Uh, let's not focus only on COVID. It's just uh, one of the other bad guys that are going to affect us. Uh, for a very long time, I suppose, and it has changed the world that we have conceived and we have always been taking things lightly. So I, I, I myself was not aware of how uh, difficult the situation could have gotten. But now here we are. Uh, but it has also brought upon a lot of opportunities, just the way we are uh, interacting more uh, than we used to before. So the, the online uh, things have become very relevant now and we can uh, talk to a lot of people at the same time, but it also has its own problems. So socially, I would say it's, it's really a testing time that we are so much used to handshaking and people greeting and, and, and all these things. And it, these old habits die hard and you always kind of, when you meet someone, we'll extend your hand and it, it, it's a difficult thing. So, now. so I will focus on uh, one aspect of this world of pandemics that we have created, the, the problem that we have as human being has contributed. We have always known that a human being is probably the greatest creation of the creator, but our contribution to actually uh, lower the quality of life on this earth is also magnanimous. It's, it's huge and we cannot even think how destructive we have got. So I would focus on forest loss and its role in pandemics. And I would briefly touch upon the issues that uh, the forest loss and degradation of the habitats and biodiversity are connected to uh, occurrence of such uh, pandemics. We know that world globally, uh, we have around 31% of the forests. The good thing is that the loss of the forest is slowly halting. But the problem with this is that this halting of the uh, global forest loss is spatially disproportionate. By, by, by spatially disproportionate, I mean that while forest in the tropics, say in the Western Europe, in North America, and partly Russia, uh, forest loss is slowly declining. The reason for this is largely economic and also mainly because the population don't depend so much on forests that they used to be in the Middle Ages. But in the tropics, which are the centers of the huge biodiversity repositories, there the trend is opposite. So uh, we are uh, seeing a, a net loss in habitat, a net loss in forest, net loss in biodiversity, and so on. So on. According to the newly published uh, World State of the Forest Report 2020, it presents a rather gloomy picture that the strategic plan of meeting the net loss of forest by 3% in 2030, we are probably not going to meet that. And it's not surprising. And by not meeting these targets, it has its own uh, relevance and it has its own problems associated with it and it is manifold and 
one of these is related to the human diseases that we are seeing that there is a the frequency of, of, of the diseases, there's more diseases, new kind of diseases that we are not prepared for. So how, how does the world forest look like? So we have around 3 billion hectares of forest in 2010, and 10 countries of the world contribute to around 65% of its forest that we have in the world. And you, we can see that India also contributes to these 10 big countries, which large share of forests. The biggest being uh, the Russian Federation, Canada, United States, and so on, Brazil, China. And India is also a, a country with a large proportion of share contributing to the world's 3 billion hectares. Now, coming to forest loss. In 2010, the world had around 4 billion hectares, around 30% of its land area covered by forests. And by 2019, there was around 87 million hectares that was lost. Coming to India, the same figure we had in 20, 2010, around uh, 31 million hectares of natural forest. So there are lots of def definitions. So I'm just painting a, la a larger picture here. So natural forest means those forests we, which have uh, largely been not influenced by human activity and which extended over 11% of the land surface. And by 2019, around 115,000 hectares of natural forest was lost and, more, and around 335,000 uh, hectares of the humid forest. So these are very important types of forests in, in the Indian context, which have been permanently lost. And it amounts to a huge proportion of emissions of anthropogenic uh, carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So this in turn also leads to uh, the, the problem of climate change and global warming. So it's a very uh, vicious feedback loop. So we destroy our forest, we contribute to climate change, and because of climate change, we are also losing our forest. So this is a very, very uh, vicious and, and problematic feedback pro uh, loop that, that we can see. So when it comes to India, unfortunately, the northeastern states, they are the repositories of really a lot of biodiversity. And these five states also contribute to the top five states which highest number in terms of forest loss. Assam tops the list, unfortunately. So we have lost since 2010 around 250,000 hectares of land. And this is uh, way over the national average of 51,000 uh, hectares of uh, natural forest, primary forest being lost. And these forests actually uh, developed over a long, long time. And since we cannot go back, we can plant new forests, but we cannot create an ecosystem that uh, the, the forest brings with it. And with ecosystem, it's not, it's not only forest that we are losing. So we are losing the ecosystem services, like shades, like uh, non-timber forest products, like timber and, and so on. But the most important in this context of the global pandemics is providing habitats. So it not only provides habitat to animals and uh, different kinds of flora and fauna, but it also provides habitat for different kinds of pathogens. That means there are lots of animals and lots of plants and different kinds of species in the forest, and they host a number of pathogens. And when we lose our forest, their habitat is also lost, and in turn, they are also in search of alternative hosts. So that is the problem which 
connects forest loss to uh, the global pandemics. So just showing you a picture of how the pandemics have developed over the years. The biggest pandemic that is known to the human history is the bubonic plague that started in uh, Europe. And then you can see from the sizes of these boxes how many people died. And we can see that the SARS and the COVID would probably be very, very tiny uh, compared to what the world has actually seen. But here the size is also proportionate to the way human beings could respond to. So in the Middle Ages, there were ex actually nothing the people could do. So therefore, you can see this huge ball and lots of people dying. And now we can do a lot of things. So uh, te technology has advanced. And the, uh, the, the more precisely, after this bubonic plague and all these things in the Middle Ages, this concept of germ theory appeared. That means uh, germs can be avoided if you maintain a certain amount of hygiene. So that thing has also improved associated with the improvement of the uh, science and technology and the clinical way of dealing with it and, and so on. So we can see that the fatalities have come down drastically, but at the same time, we don't know what is lying in the future. So we have to be prepared for this. So I would just start with this uh, bubonic plague. It uh, is one of the, the worst uh, pandemic that world has known. It is caused by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis and it actually wiped off around 50 million people mainly in Europe and it actually led to uh, like a death of around 25 to 60 percent of the present European population. So just imagine how how devastating it would have been and not only uh, in, in, in the science, but also in the art. So you can see all these uh, paintings from this, uh, the old uh, times, which depicts, for example, the one in the right side, how the people in the, in the streets are dying because at that time, the personal hygiene was not known. There used to be fields, bodies, uh, uh, all, all kinds of dirty things on, on the roads and people were not aware that these hygienic situation can lead to such a, a problematic situation. There is, is a lot of studies, uh, some uh, very renowned, which links this bubonic plague to habitat loss, forest loss. So what happens is that when the forest was uh, lost during the, the Middle Ages because of various wars and shipbuilding industries, glass industries, and so on, so this led to the reduction in the large mammals and predators, which enabled the rodent population to grow uninhabited. So that means the rodents, which used to be uh, controlled by these large mammals, so they are now free, they could uh, reproduce at, a, at an unprecedented rate. And then it combined with the lack of predation and easy access for these rodents for fruits in the croplands. So then this, rodents which carried these fleas and these fleas which carried this bacteria, they got an easy access to the human population. And there something happened what we know as the zoonotic spillover. So by zoonotic means any disease that jumps from animal hosts or vertebrate host to human host. So that is something which is very, very important when it comes to any pathogen or pan pandemics, uh, which had, has a, had a known uh, zoonotic origin. So what is the zoonosis? Zoonosis is a disease or infection transmitted to humans from other animals. We know a lot about the zoonosis, for example, very well-known diseases like rabies, leptospirosis, anthrax, SARS, all coronavirus, chikungunya, HIV, Ebola virus, all these are zoonotic. So that means they had an origin probably in the wild, in the wild animal, and somehow they could spill over from the wild animal host to the human host. 
And this spillover is something which probably we have contributed. Probably what we have done, we have done something wrong so that these spillovers could happen. So the mechanism of this spillovers is actually not well known. It's a very, very complex dynamics. What we know is uh, that forest loss, bushmeat consumption, etc., are one of the most important contributors. So here we can see a very simple chart of how the transmission of the pathogen from vertebrate or any other animals to human can occur. So first we degrade the habitat. So we deforest them. And then what happens is that those animals which were carrying some sort of pathogens which were relevant for the human uh, diseases, they did not have the habitat and they were in lookout for alternative habitats. To compound the situation, if such animals are being consumed by human beings and they are stocked in very cramped situation and they are being handled in a non-professional way, there is a lot of animals, a lot of things uh, touching each other, uh, their uh, body fluids are exchanging, then there is a chance that from one host to another animal host, the virus or any other pathogens, there is a possibility that they can exchange. And then comes the problematic part that when human beings handle such uh, animals or, or such host uh, of, of diseases, there is a chance that this will jump from its animal host to the human host. And this is how this whole mechanism of zoonosis occurs, or the zoonosis spillover occurs. So it is not as simple as it is shown in this study by WWF, so, but it is very pictorial to understand the basic concept of how it actually occurs. So what are the major drivers of this spillover? Bushmeat consumption is one of the most important ones. Having a lot of animals in a confined situation so that they cannot move. They, there is a lot of exchange in their saliva, in their body fluids and so on. So human gets in contact with these animals and the chances are that the diseases that they are hosting are also transmitted to us. Deforestation, one of the most important causes of such animals being captured from the wild and also that the natural host and natural predator prey mechanism is disrupted. So these animals which were actually hosting these kind of uh, pathogens can spill over to the human population. One thing that we cannot do much about the problem, it is being, it's adding to this problem is the uh, problem of climate change. So add, as the global temperature warms up, this also creates conducive environment for many pathogens to breed and multiply. So to understand it, a very simple way is that when we have a refrigerator, we put our uh, food there. So there we can uh, prolong the shelf life of our food because we, the temperature is controlled. So when our fridge gets uh, damaged, bad, then we can see that lots of our vegetables and other things will also get spoiled. So the same thing occurs also in terms of how these uh, animal-borne uh, pathogens, when the temperature increases, they also have conducive environment to reproduce and also become, for example, for virus, also become very dangerous. I don't know how the mechanism is uh, because I'm not a virologist, <laughs> And one of the most important things which have contributed, which is the problem of the technology, that so we have become more connected to each other. So the, the world is more connected now. So this is the new normal. So we are connected. We have lost our forests. We don't know how to deal. Uh, we have certain cultures in which uh, bushmeat consumption is uh, very uh, highly uh, relevant. And all these things together is actually dealing, uh, leading with uh, to these major drivers for the zoonosis to happen and for, for the pathogen to spill from its original host where it was being controlled by different prey predator mechanism to human beings. 
So as I said, uh, that this mechanism is actually not well known, but recently there was a study in Nature by Flowright and his colleagues who have somehow provided a basic <clears throat> template to understand how this zoonotic spillover occur. That means how uh, the reservoirs of these pathogens, they migrate from its original human uh, uh, animal host and they can actually uh, infect human being. So here you in the uh, right hand side, you can see that the first thing that is required for such a, a spillover to happen or such a migration from the animal to human host is that there has to be a reservoir of these pathogens. So they, they can be in, in the pigs, they can be in bats and, and lots of animals and we don't know about them. The problem is that we don't know much about these viruses and the population of this virus or bacteria or any other pathogen that has the uh, capacity to uh, infect us. So they were under control in this reservoir population, which were being taken care of this rule of nature that whatever, uh, which animal is uh, like strong, he will or she will survive and the one which are not strong enough will be wiped out. So this rule of nature follows and it is being taken care of. Now, when we destroy the forest, we disrupt this balance. And then there are three main mechanisms in which these pathogens can escape the reservoir. By excretion, so that means by the, uh, the deposits or, or excreta of these animals, which uh, are probably being handled by, by human beings. By slaughtering them, that means if we eat such infected animals, we come in really uh, strong contacts with the pathogens as well. And also vector bone, that means if those pests, they bite you, they suck your blood or in many other mechanisms in which the vector, so the animal which carries these uh, pathogens, they come in contact with some way or the other to your bloodstream or to your lymph nodes or to your body. Then there is a dynamic. So this is actually a very rare event. So this zoonotic uh, spillover is not occurring every day. So to, for a virus or a bacteria to migrate its original uh, reservoir population and affect a human population is actually a rare phenomena. And many of these intermediate steps have to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. So there has to be a host, there has to be a vicinity of uh, the, the animal human contact and the, uh, the, the host and the pathogen should come in sync with each other. They, the host should be weak and the pathogen should be strong enough to infect. And all these things, when they, these meet, there is a very high chance that the human beings has the potential uh, for probability that they will be infected by such uh, pathogens. And here, one more thing is important is the pathogen pressure. So this is something which we can influence by our personal hygiene, how responsive we are in terms of how in the infrastructure of the country are, are uh, dealing with such a situation. So during the COVID situation, the, we have come uh, to this very uh, harsh truth that we are simply not prepared. So it is not only the case of uh, low and middle income countries uh, that M Dr. Mustafa has mentioned. It is also for the, the economically advanced countries. So it is the attitude of how we are actually, how serious we are in terms of the diseases. Are we serious enough? So this is also, this is something which if we are serious enough, we can break this pathogen pressure right here. And this will not, even though we have destroyed our forest, we can live with a certain amount of the problem that it does not become the 
the size of a pandemic, for example. So if we maintain, if we uh, invest in, in certain uh, things that we need to tackle such a problem. Now, what is happening is that the world is seeing emergence of zoonotic diseases, which was not seen before. So these kind of novel uh, viruses, novel bacteria, and on, on all these things, which are becoming very prevalent. So here is a list of some of the well-known uh, diseases that is being uh, caused by uh, animal uh, hosts. So th there is something that relates from forest uh, to the biodiversity, the animals which were hosting these diseases and all the way uh, to human being. Lyme disease, for example, this is a very, very common disease, an incurable one in North America and in Europe, especially for us who goes into the forest. What happens is that there is a tick uh, which uh, is being hosted by deers. And then when the forests are cleared and these deers are very close to the human population, these ticks are also in the grasses. And if these ticks die, uh, like bite you, then there is a chance that you will get this Lyme disease. And this is very, very dangerous. I mean, I know personally people who has got Lyme disease and it is incurable. And it is actually much more painful than getting the coronavirus where if you are young, if you are healthy, and the, the, the death rate is not as much as in the Lyme disease. It is really, really a bad, bad problem. So see, here where this disease is prevalent in North America and Europe, which is pr uh, probably economically well off than other countries, but there is a probability that this emerging zoonotic will not discriminate how much money you have. It will discriminate only when you have a positive attitude and you are prepared for your what is coming, like, uh, like uh, investing in health and infrastructures and so on. Ebola virus, for example, has a very strong relation to forest loss. So there has been a lot of studies which uh, conclusively established that in Africa where it originated, it is strongly related to the destruction of the forest, encroachment of the habitat, and this we, it was a laboratory of this zoonotic spillover in the, in the textbook kind of a situation. So here's another uh, graph that I would like to share is that we, we can see that not only in India, Africa, uh, South America, uh, and, and so on, but in all of the world, there is an emergence of the, these new diseases from, so this study, by Kilpatrick and so on, published in Lancet. They studied the occurrence of these diseases over a few decades, and they found that this frequency or the number of cases are actually increasing for many of these cases. For example, tick-borne encephalitis was not really known in the Europe. And now we have quite a lot of cases. Malaria is actually also coming uh, to many parts of Europe, which actually got rid of this. And it is also partly because of the climate change and the global warming that uh, the, the atmosphere gets warmed up and it's more conducive for mosquitoes to, to breed. Western Nile virus, which was not known in the central uh, of the United States, and it is again coming back. So this, all these diseases, they have actually animal origin. And being animal origin, it is some way or the other related to how we have dealt with our forests. So we have always seen forests as a source of timber production, as a source of raw materials, but never as a source of the ecosystem services. So we cannot actually uh, put a price on if I maintain my forest, how much will I gain in terms of not investing in health infrastructure to control Lyme disease, for example, to control tick-borne encephalitis, for example. So this is something which is in the future when we don't know. We have never thought, the world has never thought in that line. We don't think about the services. We don't, 
because we cannot put a price on them it is not very very difficult that how would i measure the oxygen that i intake and how much per liter is it two rupees it is five rupees ten euros it i don't know so that's the problem i know how much it would cost if i cut down a tree and make a uh, furniture so that is very easy but this looking it into the ecosystem services point of view that makes it difficult and that is the only solution to actually uh, tackle these kinds of problems that we see forests biodiversity all of these kinds of things as a whole and not only for uh, product oriented approach that we have right now so this would uh, be my last slide i like to keep it very short so what are the probable solutions so there cannot be one solution that fits that there is all there should cannot be one size fit all strategy in terms of forest loss pandemics and this kind of uh, problems that emanates from the forest and ultimately affect the human being. So we should stop the forest loss and at the most we should at least half our footprint on nature. So we should be very careful of how we are dealing with the extinction of the species. We should have policies for halting climate change. This is a very very important one and many of these diseases are actually also linked to this uh, climate change. One more important thing is that the policies dealing with such problems should be not only cross-sectoral, but also transnational. By cross-sectoral, I mean uh, they should be from, not only for one sector, that means we don't, one sector, say the, the, all, all of the world, uh, to, to put it in an example that, the teaching or, or the education sector do not talk to the health sector. The health sector do not talk to the infrastructure sector. So this is the problem. We don't have policies that if we are dealing with health problems, we are dealing only with health. So we would build hospitals. Uh, we are not thinking about how building hospitals is actually linked to saving forests. So there is no way, and it is also difficult. It's, it's better to say it in five bullet points, but it is extremely difficult to achieve this. But transnational policies is one thing which is very, very important. And I would like to stress here the, the role of the European Union that we are doing here, since the countries are bound by a certain amount of regulations under the European Union, we can, uh, easily deal with the situation of policies being not only say for Austria, but we have policies that surrounds for other countries that are in the European Union. This can also be done in the Indian context, but here is also the question of the geopolitics and, and all other things that come into the picture. And we are not talking about that. So, but this is something we have to keep in mind that we are not living in isolation these days. We are contacting with everyone. We are handshaking every day to people we don't know. And most important of all, sharing information. So that's why webinars like this, it's very important. So we have to share data. We have to continuously monitor the situation. So here I would like to envisage that the start of the disease, for example, there is a lot of speculation by uh, countries where the diseases originate and there there were problems with sharing data and that also is probably the, uh, the, the reason why we are seeing that the problem has achieved such a big magnitude. So if there was a transparent share of data, probably this will be important. This, this can actually halt significantly such diseases. So with this, I would come to end of my talk. Thank you, sorry for it was, everything is written in German, except for thank you for your attention. And I would like to ask if there is any question, I'd love to address them. Thank you very much. 
Okay. <coughs> Hello. Am yes. I, am I audible? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Devajuti Chakraborty, for your wonderful presentation. It was informative as well as enlightening. I hope our esteemed participants have uh, really enjoyed the talk. Uh, now we can move on to the question answer session, uh, which will be executed by uh, Dr. Jugabrot Das. Uh, it's over to you now, Dr. Jugabrot. Thank you, Dr. Bada sir and Dr. Devbhuti Chakraborty sir. And uh, it's time for question hour. And uh, we have numbers of question. And for time restriction, I will pick uh, three of them. And the first question uh, uh, asked by uh, Dr. Das, I, I can see those questions. Maybe it would be uh, much better. I would just read them and okay, try okay. to address yes. them as yes, uh, much yes, as I, I can, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, the, the first question from Dhruva Kalita. So can certain plants in nature uh, or forests increase the body's resistance to coronavirus infection? Uh, I, I don't know about, about them, but there's can't, because we know many of our medicines have plant origin. So in, in that case, there can be certain things. So uh, in terms of improving your resistance or overall health, there is a lot of things. So I, I, I probably am not the, the correct person to, uh, uh, to respond to this question. But yes, certainly there, there are, uh, should be some sort of uh, um, some 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 sort of uh, um, solution that is uh, in the, in the plants. So, but uh, I don't know which which ones. But as as I have read, maybe Mr. Mustafa will be a better person to uh, answer this. Like increasing the amount of vitamin that you take, overall health. So you have to take care of your uh, overall resistance. So you eat well, drink well. All, all these things, and you have to uh, take care of what you eat. Uh, that, that, that's, I think, is one of the most important things. So from Lutfor Rahman, uh, is there a relation between high growth population, loss of forest, and present pandemic? Yes, absolutely, because population pressure, pressure is one of the most important cause of the forest loss. So it has been observed everywhere, be it Europe, America, uh, India, everywhere. So why is Europe and North America seeing a decline in forest loss? Because the population growth is not as much as it used to be in, in the Middle Ages and people are not dependent so much on forests. So it is very much population density dependent. Uh, Moni does, there should be an international convention to ban live animal markets. See, uh, this is a very, very tricky uh, th uh, thing to answer because live animals, how they are being treated and people are eating, this is a cultural issue. And the government has a role to, to uh, play here, but this is also a very, very tricky uh, question. But certainly there should be standards in which live animals are being held and treated in, in the animal, in, in the markets. But certainly if you ask my personal opinion, I would vote for banning live animal markets, at least for the endangered species, or at least for those species in uh, which we know that there are instances of diseases migrating from the animal to the human populations. So Asus, uh, I think this is not a name, but maybe, uh, okay. Uh, what is the pathogen tighter to produce symptoms of coronavirus infection in human? Uh, I did not really understand this question. Uh, I would go to the next one, Paramita Chakravarti. Uh, I'll link to four. Uh, uh, there, there is, Paramita, there is a very um, complicated relation on how forest loss and COVID is related because we have now first evidences that the coronavirus was actually carried by either pangolin or either bats, all these which are coming from the forest. We don't know exactly which one is responsible, but certainly there are indications that 
the virus has multiplied and jumped from one of the uh, forest uh, based host before it migrated to human beings. So certainly there is a lot of things actually which we don't know, but there are first evidences coming out that bats and pangolins are responsible for bearing this uh, pathogen and forest loss have certainly aided to how the human population got in touch with the pangolin and the bats. Uh, Abdul uh, Barik Ahmed, I'll request your phone number. Uh, I would uh, give it to uh, the organizers and they can uh, circulate uh, it. Can the virus be detected through ELISA? I, I believe ELISA is a test. I'm not a, a virologist. Maybe Mustafa can answer it better. Um, another question for me, practical implementation of carbon tax and it will prevent. Yeah, th this is a very good question, Shubham. Uh, yes, carbon tax can certainly help to prevent loss of forest on the large amount. But again, this taxes to be implemented, you also need to uh, understand, for example, for countries like India, Brazil, and, and so on, where a lot of people who are living in the brink of poverty. So they are very much dependent on the forest and to bring carbon tax to them would probably be not a good idea. But certainly we can tax the big corporates who are responsible for the forest loss and putting up the factories and industries. They should be taxed very hugely when it comes to uh, forest loss. But at the same time, you we also need to uh, make a balance that our taxation is not overweighing the economic gains that we are uh, supposed to get from these industries. So there's, I, I certainly vote for carbon tax if it is knowledge-based. So there has to be a, a strong science-based decision behind uh, this taxation. Nobody, uh, apart from COVID that Assam is facing flood, which is becoming a natural disaster every year, did forestry show a vital role? Yes, certainly floods are, uh, floods are a very big problem in Assam. And no wonder you can see that in my slides, Assam also tops the list of forest loss in terms of the numbers. We are the first uh, state in India with the biggest amount of forest being lost. So you can see it in the situation that if you have a sponge, it can hold the water. So if you put a lot of holes in the sponge, then the water oozes out. This is how actually uh, forests deal with floods. So if we have a lot of natural growth, the soil is moist and there is a very integrated mechanism in which uh, uh, the, the tree cover actually uh, takes care of the flood. Uh, Abhishek, uh, your presentation truly. Thank you very much, Abhishek. Assam has a great forest resources and many people are dependent on it for their daily life. So what if those people get affected by disease and dwelling can spread in the community? Can it be controlled in any way? Uh, Abhishek, this is uh, also the question that if they would be affected, they uh, would be affected the same way as me and you will be affected. And it has to be dealt the same way, the clinical way that we uh, we know. And yeah, we have a lot of resources, but at the same time, we are also losing our forest resources as, at an unprecedented uh, rate. So we need to take care of uh, this problem. Uh, Biodiversity and pandemic is interrelated or not, Aparna Das? Well, biodiversity as pandemics has, is quite uh, interrelated. Uh, if you mean uh, by correlation, there is these studies. So because uh, for COVID, we don't really know quite well because it is new. But for other diseases like malaria, like, uh, like Ebola virus and, and so on, there has been undoubtedly uh, it has been proved that forest loss, biodiversity loss, that means loss of the host, this is actually primarily related to uh, the, the pandemic. That means uh, it's certainly forest loss and biodiversity loss is certainly a part of this problem. That means you are 
making it easy for the pests and pathogens to attack human beings, if I may answer it uh, in, in a simple way. So you are making it very easy for them if you destroy the forest. Does mutation caused by antigen drift? Uh, Alankita Kaur, I am not uh, uh, an appropriate person to answer your question. Maybe Mr. Mustafa can. Uh, Abhishek again. Assam has great resources, daily means of life. So what are affected by disease? Animals dwelling in the forest and spread to the community. Uh, spreading to the community again has to come from uh, a combination of top-down and bottom-up approach. That means there has to be an infrastructure that has to be, uh, people need to, to be aware of their actions. So if you, we are not uh, uh, like, following the instructions that is important for controlling this disease, then certainly uh, there is a great probability that these diseases will spread in the community. And uh, I would like to stress here that forest loss, biodiversity loss and pandemics, it is not really that if you cut down the forest, then tomorrow you are going to be attacked by Ebola virus and, and so on. It is a very slow and complex mechanisms so put it simply that you are making it very convenient for the viruses and the bacteria to attack you if you are destroying your forest. So you are actually disrupting this prey and predator dynamics. That's how it works. Monil Hawk, uh, it is possible from one person to be infected still another. Uh, knowing the symptoms, I think yes, that's what uh, Dr. Mustafa just told about the asymptomatic uh, part of this problem. Um, we are not evolving as a species, Mr. Biswajit Pal. Uh, and the changes that are taking place at, of course, forest degradation, etc. But are we evolving? Yes, of course, we are also evolving. Yeah, this is actually, I, I like this question. This is, uh, see, this is, we are evolving and so are our pests and pathogens. But the problem is, are we evolving fast enough? We, no one can evolve fast enough. If I take, uh, may give you the example of uh, climate change. So climate change is affecting, say, uh, biodiversity and forest species. So many species of forests will be dying because of climate change, but they're also evolving. But the speed of climate change is way more faster than the species to evolve. So this is also the case of human being. Are we fast enough to evolve the pandemics? So the, it is taking place in a very, very short period of time. Maybe in generations to come, we may uh, evolve from, but, but not currently. Uh, this is always there. We are also evolving. So are our so-called enemies. Uh, does threefold homemade mask protect 100% for the virus? I guess so. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think it does because there has been a lot of studies which shows that masks, it's a very simple protection, but it has been very, very effective. Yes. Arif Hussain? I mean, I yeah. Yes. So 85%. If you yeah, just so that, is gamocha over like yeah. this, mm -hmm. and it's effective, 85%. That, that's that's a that's a huge amount. So eighty five percent is with a simple device. I would say this is extremely efficient. Uh, Arif Hussein, uh, is there any impact of temperature, rainfall, or climatic factors that spread population pathogenicity? Certainly, yes. All these uh, factors actually lead to how the virus or the bacteria multiply their dynamic. Their population dynamics is very much. Uh, related to their and uh, the, the climate in which they evolve or they reproduce and multiply. So if it is warmer, in general, it is very easy for the pathogens and the uh, pests to multiply. And the chances are that you will be affected with and you will have less immunity as well. Mm. Pradeep Kumar Shahu, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Pradeep. To spray around places where people gather. Uh, if you mean by spraying disinfectant, I guess this is also one of the um, uh, hygiene uh, or, or the disinfecting mechanism that uh, the governments take. I think it is also effective. 
uh, Polash, is there supposed to be such an harp or planned destruction which might have recent uh, harp plan destruction of which might have caused it is very difficult to uh, polish to pinpoint if there is a very very direct relation that i have destroyed the habitat of certain plant and that is why i am getting these pandemics as i um, would like to repeat that it's a it's a long and complicated web not even a chain that if you are uh, fiddling with part of this chain you are affecting the whole web. That means if you are making it easier for the bacteria and virus to breed and reproduce because you have provided alternative habitat, there is a chance that you will also be affected by this. Okay. Our individual. Sir, uh, yes. Uh, can I right now wind up the question and the question uh, keeping the time restriction in mind? Okay. And. Uh, the participants can uh, mail also to you that question. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I could not take all these questions. There are, of course, yeah. time limitations. My email is there. You can uh, ask me questions anytime you yeah. wish. But thank you very much for this nice uh, platform and opportunity. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bada sir and Dr. Devagiti Sakrapati sir. And uh, uh, for your nice presentation and uh, right now we have with us uh, dr binoy kumar natsar dr binoy kumar natsar he is uh, yes, uh, the president of I governing body palpara college yeah if and i, I would like to request to you are yeah, you audible I'm... to me yes sir you are yes, audible sir. Yes, sir. oh now thank you so i feel very proud and glorified for this uh, uh, type of uh, webinar organized by uh, you all, this uh, principal, Dr. Varman, Sutia, head of the department, and other colleagues. So, my special thanks to uh, Dr. Mustafa Marvia and Devasati Chakravarti. I could follow Devasati Chakravarti fully, being a uh, very much uh, of a student of economics, environmental economics. And uh, really, uh, I also hope that uh, we'll go for an e-journal where you people like Abhijit Sukhravati and uh, Mustafa will be able to uh, contribute to our e-journal. And uh, your, this, uh, experiences and your knowledge can be uh, can be given to the students and uh, they will be benefited. I hope that uh, uh, this uh, Pradeep Shutya, head of the department and uh, under the leadership of principal will organize uh, to uh, for uh, organize for such EJAD because you see, every adversity has some silver lining. And the silver lining here is that uh, we have a number of adversities because of pandemic situation. We have silver lining of this digital TC. So, so far there are this Zoom, Google, Meet, all these things are there. These are coming up because of the adversities. And this during this period, we are getting some opportunities also. And we must utilize these opportunities. And uh, definitely, uh, these resource persons all over the world, Austria, America, and that day, uh, we have also uh, have the opportunity to get uh, this link uh, with uh, a number of other experts and we will certainly try to link up uh, the connectivity with these uh, experts from all over the globe. Hope that Gualpara College is taking the lead. This leadership uh, of this Gualpara College is uh, 
followed by the other colleges and i will be happy that uh, this leadership will continue thank you thank you uh, dr vinay kumar nath sir for your valuable and uh, encouraging speech and uh, now we are almost coming to the end of this webinar and uh, for the next program i'm providing the key to ms krishna varman assistant professor department of zoology to extend good of thanks over to krishna thank you sir sir can you hear me yeah yes yes okay good morning all respected and our most distinguished speakers of today's national webinar covid-19 pandemic and its impact on human and environment dr mustafa a borbia sir dr debojuti chakraborty sir respected principal dr subhas parman sir respected president um, governing body gwalpara college dr vinay kumar nath sir respected hod department of geology professor pradeep sutia sir honorable tisa colleagues and all respected participants i deem it a great honor to propose our heartfelt vote of thanks to the distinguished speaker dr borfuya sir and dr chakraborty sir for gracing today's webinar i would like to thank dr borfuya sir for his very interesting and thought provoking address in such a relevant topic i would also like to express our profound gratitude to dr chakraborty sir for such an excellent presentation on the topic of forest loss and pandemics i also like to thank to both of you sir for sharing your valuable knowledge with us and making today's webinar a successful and meaningful one i would like to thank our principal sir for taking effort to make this national webinar possible we are really thankful to you sir for your kind support and encouragement i also like to thank president sir for your precious presence on today's webinar our heartfelt thanks to our department hod sir for his continuous support and guidance to make this webinar successful i would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to dr thiras kumar bora sir and dr anjam hussein borfuya sir co-ordinator of this national webinar for coming up with the idea of co-ordinating this wonderful webinar during this lockdown period I also like to thank Dr. Jukoprata Das sir for conducting this webinar so beautifully. Especially I want to thank Dr. Dulal uh, Chandra Borua sir co-ordinator IQAC Gwalpara College. This webinar would not have been possible without your kind support sir. Especially I want to thank all our respected participants who have turned up in such a great number not only from our college but also other colleges universities institution all over India thank you so much for paying your valuable attention and making this webinar possible and successful with your precious presence thank you all and have a great day ahead thank you thank you miss krishna varman for your introduction thank you and uh, now may i request uh, our principal sir to speak a few words on this entire webinar concluding words uh thank you dr mustafa a borbhuya uh, dr dabuluti sokroborty thank you for your illuminating uh, presentation and i am sure all of our participants have been immensely benefited because uh, dr mustafa uh, he has been uh, you have been working uh, from inside and you are uh, you know the our strategy for against covid 19 you are also working on that and uh, from inside you have been working so thank you dr mustafa borbuya and uh, the thing is you inspired our you inspired our uh, teachers our faculty members and participants and i am sure uh, you will be inspiring our students you have reached such a height and you are uh, in the country which is uh, apex and the thing is which is also working for solution so dr borbuya you continue your 
Odyssey, you continue to guide our country and our students, our people. Thank you, Dr. Borbuya. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Devojiti Sokroborty, your, your, your lecture, it's, it's uh, really, you have highlighted a very important dimension which has been invis invisible. Actually, we talk a lot about bias, epidemics, and those things, but it's relation with our ecosystem, particularly with the forest. That's a very significant, uh, you, you, whatever you have highlighted, I'm sure it, it will bring a very important dimension to center stage. And uh, forest is such a important. Today I have realized that uh, with epi epidemics, we need to uh, develop this dimension, this, this forest and ecosystem. We know these trees and plants, it play a very important role in uh, solution means in, as, as medicine, medicine, plants and those things. But the holistic approach, we need a, a balanced approach towards our nature. So thank you, Dr. Sokroborty and both, both of pleasure. you, thank uh, you sir. Yeah, both of you, uh, we are looking forward to work with you. You have to guide us. Uh, sincerely, I'm uh, requesting you, you, you continue your advice and guidance to all my colleagues. And I express my thanks to uh, Professor Sutia, head of the department, Geology, and my special uh, thanks for organizing this work uh, to be part of this webinar, our very learned, uh, who has been inspiring us, Dr. Binoy Kumar Nath. He has been, actually he was also in Europe and he was the formerly director of higher education. So he has been guiding this college. So thank you all. And with these few words, I once again, uh, thanks my participants, all participants, and the webinar is over. Thank you very much.